So implicit differentiation is basically doing the derivative by the wrong variable. So if I were to give you an example, um, y equals 5x squared plus 8x minus 4. Uh, you can take the derivative of that. Um, we've done it many times before. Uh, bring the 2 down in front. 2 times 5 is 10. Reduce the exponent by 1. You get x to the 1. Uh, this is secretly an x to the 1, so bring the 1 down in front. 1 times 8 is 8, and this becomes x to the 0. But x to the 0 I don't really need to record anymore. And the negative 4 drops away, so that I don't have anything left there. And what we've been calling that derivative is dy by dx. And that didn't cause any problems at all, because the x in this equation happen to match the x by which I was taking the derivative of. So in this next unit, um, well in this topic anyway, uh, and the one after related rates, we're going to need to be able to take the derivative by a letter that is not the letter given to you in the equation. So to show you how to do that, um, I'm going to start with this same equation I had, 5x squared plus 8x minus 4. <clears throat> and instead of taking dy by dx, I'm going to take the derivative dy by dt. Now I'm using t because um, it's going to come up a lot. Uh, t for time. So basically this was how is the y value of your function changing as you scroll across x? Well that's a like spatial relationship, right? How does this change as I walk that way? dy dt is a time relationship. How is your y value changing over time? Well, that's you know, a little physics-y maybe. So I'm just going to do it, and then we'll maybe see if we can spot the consequences and why it happens that way. So the first thing I'm going to do is look at that 5x squared, and I'm going to remind myself that I'm taking its derivative, and I'm going to remind myself that the derivative of 5x squared is 10x. Now the thing that I don't know is how is x related to t? So every time I take a derivative of x by the wrong variable, I need to attach a correction factor, like so. So how does y change over time? Well, it depends on where you are, and it depends on this thing, dx by dt. If you look at the units on that, dx over dt. Uh, x is a measure of space, so that would be measured in meters. And t is a measure of time, that would be measured in seconds. The units on this thing are meters per second. That's a speed. So if I have a relationship, right, like this is a parabola, if it looks like this, and I have a, a slope, right? How the slope of this parabola is related to wherever I am on the x-axis, then my height on this parabola as a function of time depends on how fast I'm running down x. So if I'm going very slowly, then my height is changing very slowly. If I'm running very quickly that way, then my height changes very quickly. So every time I have one of these mismatches, I just need to toss a correction factor on to indicate how quickly I'm moving along the x-axis. So if I go to do this next part, I have to remind myself that the derivative of 8x is just 8. And then because the x and the t don't match, I need to tack a dx by dt on the back there. The derivative of negative 4 would be 0. Technically, you could attach a dx by dt there, but 0 times anything just goes away. So I end up with that. <clears throat> now, if you like, you could factor that. So I have a dx by dt in this term and in that term. So if I factor it out and park it at the back, I end up with this. Now I'm done. Okay, so, so complete. Ooh. Smiley face. 
So the next thing I just want to point out to you is how um, this like fraction type notation is handy when doing derivatives. Is this thing here, 10x plus 8? Well, that's dy by dx. So if I just look at this little arrangement here. You notice that if these things were fractions and truly behaved like fractions, I'd be able to eliminate those and end up with just dy over dt, which is what I've been handed here in the first place. This is actually the technical definition of how your chain rule is supposed to work. If you want to take the derivative of y by some variable, maybe I wanted to do this dy by dp. Well, I don't have a function with p in it. I have a function with x in it. So the best I can do is dy by dx. And I'll have to leave a correction factor of dx by dp to make sure I end up with dy dp at the end. This part's a little abstract. The point of all this is when I see a derivative, if I have a match between the thing in the denominator here and the thing that's in the function, I just take the derivative like normal. If I have a mismatch between the variable I'm handed and the derivative I'm asked to take, I take the derivative just like normal, but I have to tack on a correction factor every time I take a derivative. Okay, so I'm going to clean this off. We'll try another example. Okay, so here's a new function. It's got a lawn. I'm going to try and take the derivative of this by t. So I'm going to notice that the variable I'm working with are x's, and the variable that I've been asked to take the derivative by is a t. So I'm going to need correction factors every time I take a derivative. So derivative of this per first part, 4 is left alone. The derivative of a ln x is 1 over x. And because x is not t, I need my correction factor. Not done. I need to take the derivative of this part. Derivative of 6x squared would be 12x. And because x is not t, I need dx dt attached at the back. Now that it's done, I could do some factoring. This would be 4 over x plus 12x. And there's a dx dt in both of these terms. So I could have leapt straight to this line by just taking the derivative of this line and then tacking the correction factor on that way. That also works whichever way you think is, is more expedient. So I'm going to do one more example so you can see some chain rule. So taking dq by dt, I see a sign, and the derivative of a sign is a cos. So I will have three cos of whatever the argument is. Now, do you notice that I didn't take the derivative of an x yet? I only did the derivative of the cos part. So I don't need the correction factor until I get to the place where I'm taking derivatives of x's. So that's the first block of my chain rule. Next chain would be the derivative of this. What's the derivative of x squared plus 4x? Well, it would be 2x dx dt, because x's are not t's, and 4 dx dt, because x's are not t's. Going on to the derivative of this thing, this is a two-layer chain rule, one for the exponent, one for the exponential. Derivative of an exponential is itself. That's the derivative of the e, not the x's, so I don't need the correction factor yet. The derivative of 5x would be 5, and because x is not t, I need dx dt. Okay. Now if I expand that out a little bit, 
I get 2x times 3 cos, so that would be 6x cos x squared plus 4x dx dt plus 4 times 3 is 12 cos x squared plus 4x dx dt and this would be 5 e to the 5x dx dt and you notice that this thing is in all three terms so I can factor it out And there's a cos x squared and a cos x squared in this and this, so I'm just going to factor that as well. 6x and 12 cos of x squared plus 4x dx, uh, all in the great big bracket, plus 5e to the 5x dx dt. And again, I could have done dq dx multiplied by dx dt and I would have just had my answer. So to try and make some sense about what this is happening, um, I'm going to do a little, a little bit of an egg hunt. So I'm going to give you uh, 10 chocolate eggs. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And then I'm going to build you a sidewalk to walk down. Etc. And on each panel of that sidewalk, I'm going to put four more eggs. Okay, as you go. So if I were to make an equation for the number of chocolate eggs you have in your basket, right, C for chocolates, then I would write out that you have 10 when you start and then you add 4 for every panel that you step down. So if you step down 3 panels you'd have 10 plus 4 plus 4 plus 4 which gives you 22. Right? That's how that works. So if I were to take this equation and take its derivative I would get dc by dp equals the derivative of 10 is gone, the derivative of 4p is 4. Okay, so if I were to read that derivative and I were to write it in plain English, that says the change in chocolate per panel is 4. Well, and you can see that, right? Each, each panel has increased your chocolate by four. Every time you step on one, you get four more eggs. But that is not the point of an Easter egg hunt, right? You don't lay them out on the sidewalk and then uh, you just sort of enjoy the fact that they're on sidewalks. You have to actually move and you have to pick them up. And so the thing that you're really concerned about during an egg hunt is how quickly am I accumulating chocolate? Because if I am not the fastest accumulator of chocolate, then someone else is getting those eggs and I don't get to have them. So I'm not interested in how many chocolates per panel there are. I'm interested in how many chocolates I have over time. How many chocolates am I picking up per second? So what I need to do there instead of DC by DP is to ask myself how many chocolates, right? What is my change in chocolate per second? If I do that, the derivative of 10 is gone, so I don't have to worry about it. The derivative of 4p is 4, but p is not t, so I have dp dt. So I just took the uh, derivative of this C equation by time instead of P, just like I did in the last two examples, and I get an expression like this. If I wrote this in English, it would say the change in chocolate per second 
is 4 times dp dt. Well, what's dp dt? Well, dp dt is the number of panels per second. That's a speed. How many panels are you getting through each second as you run down the sidewalk wolfing down chocolate eggs? Well, of course you need that in this term. If you're trying to figure out how many eggs per second you're picking up, if I don't know how quickly I'm moving down the sidewalk, then I don't know how quickly I'm picking up the chocolate eggs. These two rates, the change in chocolate over time and the change in panels over time, these two rates are related to each other. This one depends on that one. So it maybe didn't occur to you that way. Um, hopefully it makes a little more sense when you see it in a, kind, in a kind of physics context that these derivatives actually mean something in real space, right? Like you can't pick up chocolate eggs without actually walking down the sidewalk. And if I want to know how many eggs you get per second, I need to know how fast you can run. Okay, so I'm going to make this example just a little bit com more complicated so we can see something happen. Okay, so <laughs> suppose the Easter Bunny at your house is, uh, or you know, whatever, um, borderline religious rodent deposits chocolate at your house while you're sleeping. Uh, is a little more whimsical and decides to leave eggs on the patio according to this equation. So when there's no panels, when you've covered none of them, this would be zero, this would be zero, you've got four eggs hanging around. When you get to the first panel, you put a one here and a one here, you'd have four plus two is six, plus one is seven. So I've added an, initial, an additional three eggs for a total of seven eggs when I'm on the first panel. So let me see, that's a total of four. Four plus three is seven. If I go on to the second panel, this would be a two, this would be a two. Four plus four is eight, plus four is 12. I had seven before, so I must have added an additional five eggs. So four and three and five is my 12 in total. Onto this panel, that's a three and that's a three. So four plus six is 10. 10 plus nine would be 19 in total. So I've added an extra, another seven. So these look like dice right up until that one. And on this fourth panel where um, I'm going to get tired of writing down dots, uh, I would have a 4 here and a 4 here. So 4 plus 8 would be 12, and 12 plus 16 would be uh, 28. And I already had 19, so I have to add an additional 9. Etc. Okay, so if I were to go and ask you how the chocolate is changing per panel, right? How, how are the eggs increasing as I go? Then I would need to do DC by DP. So the derivative of four is gone. The derivative of two P is two. The derivative of two P squared, or P squared would be two P. So you can see that, that this does not match this exactly. Um, and it's falling apart a little bit because I'm, I'm dealing with these sidewalk chunks in a quantum kind of way. Like you're either on this panel or you're on that panel, you're never in between. And um, so basically what I've sketched for you is this, which is not a continuous parabola. So it's not quite right but it'll do. Do you notice that when you're on the first panel, you've added, um, so one, one times two would be two, plus two is four. You're adding almost four. On the second panel, two times two would be four, plus two, you're adding almost six. 
On the third panel, two times three is six, plus two is eight, right? Like we're adding almost fat each time. So this is a number representing how much the eggs are changing as we go up there. So you can see that like, if I were running along this part of the sidewalk, the number of eggs I'm getting per second will be smaller than if I was running on this part of the sidewalk, simply because there are more eggs to pick up per panel. You notice that that matters. When I go to figure out the number of chocolates I'm picking up over time, the two things I need to worry about, about are how many chocolates are there per panel and how quickly am I crossing panels per second. So you can see how that chain rule is working out, right? The DPs would cancel and you're left with DC over DT. But basically the idea of picking up chocolate Easter eggs under this model is how many are there on the panel I'm running by and how many panels am I running by each second. So in this particular example, DC DT would be this many eggs per panel and DP DT. How quickly am I running? So I know that the, the picture kind of broke down a little bit, but it should give you the rough idea that because the number of eggs on the panels are changing, I need to have some uh, something to reflect that in my equation in addition to this how quickly am I running down the sidewalk. So when you get into the related rates problems, um, anything that has a geometric relationship, you can take the derivative of this by time and see how the volume would evolve as the radius evolved. So for this section, I'm not worrying about the application of it. I just want to do the implicit differentiation on these geometric models. So dv, I could do dv dr, and that would be a straight up derivative because I have r as my variable. Or I could do dv by dt. So 4 thirds is just a constant. It's unaffected by a derivative. Pi is just a constant as well. And the derivative of r cubed would be 3r squared but r is not t, so I need the correction factor. Now that would simplify to 3 cancels 3, I get 4 pi r squared dr dt. So in this particular example, this one is like the sidewalk where the eggs were different. There were more eggs on, more on the panels the deeper in you got. If you can think about a balloon blowing up, right? because um, that's what this is, the volume of the sphere, the first breath you put in, one change in volume over time, makes the balloon go from limp to about this big. And then the next breath makes it go this big, and the next breath makes it go this big. And as you go, there are diminishing returns. That's because it takes more volume to extend the radius as the radius l gets larger. That's what this r squared is doing in there. Right? This is a dv dr term. And this is the how the dr dt would be the change in the radius as you go. Right? That's the speed at which the radius is expanding. So for all we're doing in implicit differenti differentiation right now is being able to take the derivative of one of these things by a variable that mismatches what's up there. So uh, I'll give you another one um, for the cylinder that also contains a product rule. So you can see how that works. <laughs> That's the volume for a cylinder. If I were to take dv dt, I can see that this thing splits as a product like that. So I'm going to need to do the derivative of the first, leave the second alone, plus leave the first alone, the derivative of the second. So the derivative of this first part, pi r squared, would be pi times 2r, but r is not t, so I need dr dt at the back. Leave h alone. Then I leave the first one alone, pi r squared, take the derivative of h, which would be 1, but h is not t, so I need the correction factor at the back. So if I simplify this a little bit, I end up with 2 
pi r h dr dt plus pi r squared dh dt. Okay, now if I were to just quick draw a cylinder for you, and then I will draw a cylinder that has been unrolled. There are two ways that you can have the volume of this cylinder grow. The first thing you can do is to keep the height constant here. So I am not letting the height change. And instead I let the radius grow. Well, if I do that, this, um, this area here, right, the, the piece that goes around the outside of the can, this rectangle here, do you notice that its length has to be the same as the circumference of that circle? And that's the height of the can. So the area of this would be 2 pi r h. It's right there. So if I'm letting the can expand, what I'm adding to the volume each time is a new layer of the area around this way at a speed determined by how quickly the radius is growing. So I'm adding layer upon layer upon layer of the outside of the can. If I did it the other way, I keep the radius constant and I let the height grow. Do you notice that pi r squared is the area of this piece on top? So what I'm adding is circles, 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 circles on top at a rate determined by how the height is changing. Now you can get real complicated and you could let them both change, right? Let the cylinder grow this way and let it grow this way, like a marshmallow exploding in the microwave. Right? Now you could figure out how much volume is being added. Or you could figure out a way to set this and this so that the volume of the marshmallow stayed the same. As it grows this way, it contracts that way because all of these rates are related. So I'm going to clear this off. We're going to do one more example um, that's similar to what the problems are asking, and then I will set you off to get some practice. OK. So this particular one is in the problem set, and it asks you to do a few things. It asks you to do dc by dA. It asks you to find dc by dB. And it asks you to find dc by dT. So if we start with dc by dA, the derivative of 2c would be, oh, so let me write that down, get dc by dA. Okay, so the derivative of c squared would be 2c. But c is not a, so I need the correction coefficient. The derivative of 2a, or a squared, is 2a. a happens to be a, I do not require the correction coefficient. Uh, correction factor. But if I wanted to, in order to remain consistent to make sure I didn't forget anything, I could write dA by dA. The derivative of b squared is 2b dB by dA. Now if you look, c over a, those don't divide out. dB over dA, those don't divide out. dA over dA, that does. So to finish this particular question, because it asks for dc by dA, I'm going to take this expression I have here, and I'm going to divide the whole thing by 2c. And since it's rude to put uh, a c in when I have a c over here, I'm going to replace c with what I've got from up here. So if c squared equals a squared plus b squared, then c is the square root of these things. So dc by dA would be 2a plus 2b dB dt, oh, sorry, dA, over 2 the square root of a squared plus b squared. There you go. And if you like, 2 and 2. This divided by 2 would be a. This divided by 2 would be b d b d a. So I can do that division and it's okay. 
All right, lovely. So if I were to clear this off then and try to do DC by DB, leave that. To do the derivative of dc by db, the derivative of 2c, or c squared, is 2c dc by db. The derivative of a would be 2a dA by db. And the derivative of b squared would be 2b db by db. But of course, db divided by db divides out, so that part disappears. And if I keep dc db by itself, actually maybe I'll just divide everybody by two, say with some pen strokes, gives me a dA by db plus b over c. And c, like in the last example, I'll replace with this. So what's changed? When I did dc by dA, the correction showed up on the b term, not the a term. When I did dc by db, the correction term ended up on the a, not the b. So if I go and I do this third one, dc by dt, what I should end up with is, because none of them are times, I should end up with the correction factor on all three. So the derivative of c squared by t would be 2c dc dt equals 2a dA dt plus 2b db dt. They all divide by 2, which leaves me with dc by dt is a dA by dt plus b db by dt all over c, which is this square root. So the problem sets are going to ask you to take some derivatives by this. Uh, so it has uh, every geometric relationship you've ever come across, and it asks you to do the derivative by every single variable that's contained inside of that equation, as well as by t. So you can get some practice with doing this. Um, so if you use this one as an example, it should get you through the problems. Good luck.